Hey guys, welcome to the fourth part of my options day trading course. If you're new here, I'm Tex and I share my journey with trading and investing in the stock market. So in the previous part, we learned about the psychological aspect of trading and why it's the most important factor to your success. Today, we're gonna learn about the technical skills required for day trading. Now, as a reminder, I put a card at the top of this video to a playlist where you can watch all parts of the course as they're released. Also, don't forget there's a lot of helpful links in the description box below, so be sure and check those out. If you would do me a favor guys, please hit that like button and leave a comment below. Let me know if you're enjoying the course and if it's helping you out. I really appreciate you guys watching as always. So let's go ahead and get started. So technical analysis is a crucial skill that you need to master as a day trader. It's defined as an evaluation process that identifies trading opportunities and price trends and chart patterns. There's numerous ways technical analysis can be used as day traders, but I'm going to focus on what I consider the most important. In this section, we'll be covering candlestick charts, support and resistance, technical indicators, price action, market internals, and the only fundamentals you need to be concerned with as a day trader. A candlestick chart is the most popular chart style among day traders for observing price trends and patterns in stocks and other securities in the stock market. Candlesticks provide the most basic of technical analysis by visually representing the emotions of market participants. Red candles signify downward bearish price movement in which the sellers are in charge. Green candles signify upward bullish price movement in which the buyers are in charge. As each candle develops, they begin to form shapes and patterns that can be used to forecast future price direction. The main components of a candlestick are the body and wicks, or sometimes called shadows. Each candle has four price points, the open, high, low, and closing price. If a candle closes at a lower price than it opened, then it's displayed as a red candle and perceived as bearish. If it closes at a higher price than it opened, then it's displayed as a green candle and perceived as bullish. The wicks signify the highest and lowest prices of the candle. Each candle represents a specific time interval. The chart on the left is a one minute time frame, thus each candle represents one minute of time. The chart on the right is a daily time frame, so each candle represents one day. Different time frames should be used to determine macro and micro trends in a security. A very short time frame like the one minute chart provides a granular view of price movement, which is useful for timing trade entries or spotting quick subtleties in price action. However, it can look a little noisy, making it more difficult to recognize trends that might be more obvious on a longer time frame. Furthermore, a trade setup on a longer time frame will generally have higher odds of success and should be prioritized over shorter time frames. Using a top-down approach to spot trading opportunities works the best. Start with a weekly or daily time frame and then work down to the one minute for timing a trade entry. In this example, you can see a trend marked on the one minute time frame compared to the same trend as seen on a five minute time frame. As you can tell, there's a lot more data on the one minute time frame with a granular view of the price action. The issue here is that new traders will often get scared if they see a sudden candle form in the opposite direction of their trade and exit the position prematurely. Simply put, it's very easy to get tricked into believing the trend is changing on a really short time frame. For this reason, I recommend switching to a five minute time frame once you're in a trade. This helps avoid fears that may occur with rapid or choppy price movements on the one minute time frame, but still allows you to observe the trend and spot market signals you need to be aware of when the time comes to exit the trade. Of course, it's always a good idea to monitor multiple time frames throughout the day. Now the most common time frames I use are the one minute, the five minute, the 15 minute, the 60 minute, the daily, and the weekly. A common yet basic form of technical analysis involves studying the shapes that candlesticks form. These are just a few of the numerous shapes possible and what I consider the most important to learn. In general terms, we can observe bullish, bearish, and neutral candlestick shapes. Candles with large bodies and little to no wick are seen as the most bullish or bearish sentiment, whereas candles with long wicks are formed at inflection points between buyers and sellers. Neutral shapes indicate indecision, as an equal amount of buyers and sellers were present during that time period. 
It's important to understand that a candlestick shape will vary depending on the time frame you're viewing. Therefore, a shape on its own does not constitute a trigger for executing a trade. I find them most useful when combined with some other form of technical analysis and price action. Additionally, it's very important to consider the larger context of the candle's location on the chart in order to determine the validity of its bullish or bearish signal. Let's look at some examples of candle shapes on a price chart. A bullish engulfing candle is one that has a long body with very little or no upper or lower wick. They clearly indicate heavy buying pressure with strong upward momentum from the open to a closing price at or near the high of that period. The engulfing nature of the candle is represented as its size completely engulfs the previous one. Conversely, a bearish engulfing candle is indicative of heavy selling pressure resulting in a much larger bearish candle that engulfs the previous candle. One of my favorite candle shapes for trading a trend reversal is called a hammer candle. It has a small red or green body with a long lower wick at least two times the length of the candle body. The key to a hammer candle is when it forms after an extended price decline. As sellers are exhausted, buyers step in to buy the dip and begin to absorb the selling pressure during that period. This causes the price to rise before the candle closes, leaving behind the long lower wick. So in this example, you can see the hammer candle formed after a month of heavy selling pressure on high volume. The next day provided confirmation as price gapped higher, trading back into the previous range. Hammer candles are most effective when preceded by at least three or more declining candles. An inverted hammer can signal another potential reversal point. In this instance, the candle has a long upper wick, indicating that buyers drove the price up at some point during the period, but encountered selling pressure which drove prices lower toward the opening price. In this example, you can see the price is struggling to move any higher as heavy selling pressure results in these long upper wicks. This offers subtle clues that you can use to determine potential reversal points. A hanging man candle looks similar in shape to the bullish hammer candle, however the context here is key to this candle shape. In this example, you can see a hanging man formed at the top of an extended bullish run, leaving the candle sort of hanging in midair. This can often be a bearish signal given the appropriate macro context. A doji candle refers to a balance between buyers and sellers. They can form in the middle of a trend as buyers and sellers digest the current price level before the trend continues, or they can also form at reversal points in trend. In this example, a gap up overnight resulted in the formation of a doji candle as sellers took some profit on the gap higher and buyers jumped in looking for a continuation higher in the coming days. This equal amount of buying and selling creates the doji candle. As I said, there are numerous shapes candles can form and covering them all is beyond the scope of this course, but these were some good examples of the most common you'll encounter and that I use in my trading every day. Now the foundation of becoming a technical trader is mastering the concept of support and resistance. In the most basic terms, every security trading in the stock market consists of supply and demand zones. A demand zone is represented as a floor or level of support where enough market participants stepped in to buy the security, causing the price to rise. A supply zone refers to a ceiling or a level of resistance where a higher number of market participants are selling a security versus buying. In this example, I've highlighted supply and demand zones on a 60 minute time frame. As price rises out of the blue demand zone, it encounters sellers in the green area, now a supply zone. The sellers drive the price down into the previous blue demand zone. Buyers step in again and price rises to a new supply zone highlighted in yellow. This structure of supply and demand zones can be observed across the entire stock market. I find that a weekly, daily, and 60 minute time frame works really well for observing these market structures. The most common use of support and resistance consists of horizontal lines, typically drawn from swing highs or swing lows. A swing high and low simply refers to the highest and lowest price before a trend reverse direction. These are also called pivots. When price moves above a resistance level, you would then look for that level to provide support. Likewise, when price moves below a support level, you would look for that to act as resistance. 
In this example, swing lows provided a support level around $2,900 and swing highs a resistance level at $3,344. On numerous occasions, the resistance level became support, then resistance again as the stock struggled to break out higher. Support and resistance levels from longer timeframes, such as a daily timeframe, will carry more weight than your shorter timeframes like a one minute. When planning trades around support and resistance levels, it's important to understand that securities don't have to stop precisely on the level. Sometimes they'll fall short or sometimes they'll overshoot the levels and then bounce back. I like to think of them more as an area rather than a specific level measured to the penny. It's important to observe the price action, or in other words, how the security interacts at that level of support or resistance to get a sense of strength or weakness. Another form of support and resistance can be observed with trend lines, which connects a series of prices together. A trend line is typically drawn over swing highs or under swing lows to show the prevailing direction of price. You need at least two points to draw a trend line, but price should touch the trend line at least three times to validate it. The more times that price touches the trend line, the more weight it holds. In this example on Facebook, the highlighted boxes are the two anchor points for the trend line, which is then validated when price touches it on several occasions later. A complex trend line is usually drawn on longer timeframes where price sliced through it before interacting with it again at a later date. In this example, you can see a trend line acting as resistance since 2008. Price sliced through it in early 2020 before reclaiming and holding it as support later in the year. Trend lines can also be used to observe channels. This is an area where price appears contained in between two trend lines creating the channel. Now I don't use these as often, but they can be helpful to spot trading opportunities when price comes into the channel top or bottom. While trend lines are very useful, they do have limitations. A trend line will sometimes last for a long time, but eventually the price will deviate enough that it needs to be adjusted. Moreover, the subjective nature in which trend lines can be drawn make them more difficult to use. For example, some traders will use the lowest lows or the highest highs, while others may only use the lowest closing prices or the highest opening prices. I find trend lines work the best when drawn across highs and lows versus open and close prices. Lastly, trend lines applied on shorter timeframes can be volume sensitive, so a trend line formed on low volume may easily be broken as volume picks up throughout the session. Fibonacci retracement is a drawing tool that can be used as another form of support and resistance. It's basically a mathematical sequence broken down into ratios that can offer clues as to where the securities price will go. I prefer to use it for measuring how far a price is likely to go after a trend reversal. I typically draw it from the swing high to the swing low for downtrends or the swing low to the swing high for uptrends. The only retracement levels I use are the 38.2%, 50%, and 61.8%. The golden Fibonacci number is 61.8 and should be the most respected level. In this example, I drew a Fib from the swing high in late February to the swing low in mid-March where price reversed from a significant downtrend. As you can see, price bounced first to the 38.2, then the 50, and finally the 61.8. After trading between the 50 and the 61.8, price finally broke above and held the 61.8 as support before continuing higher. While FIBs can be used on any time frame, more weight should be placed on longer time frames like a daily chart as this example demonstrates. FIBs can also be useful for measuring gaps, which is when a stock opens much higher or lower than the previous day's close. Technical indicators are another form of technical analysis that traders can use to determine trends and spot trading opportunities. Now there's a vast amount of indicators that you can add to your chart, but I'm only going to recommend a few. It's very easy to fall into the trap of using too many indicators as a new trader, so I want to keep things as simple as possible for you. My preferred indicators include volume, volume weighted average price, moving averages, and the pivot point study. It's important to understand that indicators are lagging price action, so it's still very important for you to master reading price action, which we'll be discussing shortly. The key to using any indicator is that it's widely used. The more market participants using a particular indicator, the better it will work because so many eyeballs are watching and respecting it. 
Now, volume is an extremely important data point used in day trading. Although it's considered an optional indicator, I feel it should be a requirement on your chart. Volume simply refers to the amount of units traded on a security. So for example, the volume on a company's stock refers to the amount of shares traded over a specific period of time. This is visually represented as histogram bars across the bottom of most candlestick charts. Generally speaking, as day traders, we like to see higher volume levels, which implies the security has good liquidity for entering and exiting trades at your desired price points. Analyzing volume trends is a key component to reading price action. Volume is also very important for momentum traders, a style of trading that seeks breakout moves in a stock on high and increasing volume. Without sufficient volume, it increases the risk on the trade because a sudden and large move in price can occur before you could stop out at your desired risk level. The Volume Weighted Average Price, or VWAP, provides a trader with the average price a security is traded throughout the day based on both volume and price. It can be used on any intraday time frame, for example, a 1 minute, 5 minute, etc. Originally used by institutions, the VWAP is now widely used by retail and professional traders as part of their trading system. It can be used both as support and resistance or entry and exit points for trades. Although it's a widely respected indicator, it isn't foolproof. Sometimes you'll find that stocks trade through it without any respect for its existence. This is common to see on a day when price action is very choppy. You'll find the VWAP is most respected on a clean, trending day. This example demonstrates how you can use the VWAP in your trading. A common strategy is to wait for a pullback to the VWAP in order to join the trend. For reversals, the VWAP offers a great target to aim for when planning your trade. Moving averages are another popular indicator that can also be used as a form of support and resistance or for targets on trade ideas. The most common are the Simple Moving Average, or SMA, and the Exponential Moving Average, or EMA. Each moving average specifies a length of time being measured. A Simple Moving Average is slower and typically better suited to longer time frame charts. An Exponential Moving Average is more responsive to price action and therefore useful for short term trading. I believe the best moving averages you can use on shorter time frame charts are Exponential. I recommend the 9 EMA and the 50 EMA for any time frame between 1 to 60 minutes. Now the 9 EMA on a 5 minute time frame is a very powerful indicator that I use every day. For daily charts I use the 5 EMA, the 9 EMA, the 20 SMA, 50 SMA, 100 SMA, and 200 SMA. Notice only the first two are exponential moving averages, the rest are simple moving averages. The 5 and 9 EMAs on a daily time frame are very powerful short term indicators that I regularly use for potential entry points or profit targets. I typically refer to them as the 5 day and 9 day. The daily 20 SMA is a widely respected indicator and often an area where investors buy an uptrending stock. The 50 SMA and the 200 SMA on a daily time frame tend to carry a lot of weight among institutions and retail investors. They're often used as a gauge to determine if the stock is in an uptrend or downtrend. The traditional pivot point indicator is one of my favorites and a key technical level that I use in my trading strategy. All of the charting software I've recommended offers this indicator. Unlike the previous indicators discussed which move with price and momentum throughout the day, the pivot point indicator is static. It's calculated by taking the average from the previous day's high, low, and closing prices. This calculation determines the pivot point for the next day. Generally speaking, when price is above the pivot point, it's thought to indicate ongoing bullish sentiment, while trading below the pivot point indicates bearish sentiment. Now the pivot point is the basis for the indicator, but it also projects support and resistance levels below and above the pivot point. Support levels are referred to as S1, S2, S3, and resistance levels as R1, R2, and R3. The large cap stocks we trade will interact with these levels on a daily basis providing trading opportunities or targets for trade plans. Besides the pivot point itself, I find the second support and resistance level, basically S2 and R2, are the most respected. When price runs into S2 or R2, it will often reverse as the chart on the right demonstrates. The last indicator you may consider is one that marks the prior day's open, high, low, and close 
although I would prioritize the high and low over the open and close. This chart demonstrates what the indicator looks like in eSignal with the prior high marked as a pink dashed line, prior close as a brown dashed line, and the prior low as a blue dashed line. You'll often find trading opportunities off of these levels, so it's useful to have them automatically marked for you by an indicator. Otherwise, it's a good practice to at least mark the prior day's high and low by drawing a horizontal line yourself. eSignal and Thinkorswim both offer a version of this indicator, but TC2000 does not. So you guys have probably heard the saying, price action is king, right? Well, simply put, price action refers to the up and down movement of a security's price. However, there's a lot more to understanding its use. Personally, I believe it's the most important and the most difficult technical skill to master in day trading. Price action forms the basis for all technical analysis of a security, and it's the best real-time indication of what market participants are doing and are likely to do thereafter. One of the easiest ways to observe price action is in the formation of candle shapes. Simply watching each candle develop provides a lot of market-generated information. Now, I'm not only talking about the shape the candle forms after it closes, but how it acts as the candle is developing. For example, if you notice a candle pops up and then quickly gets stuffed back down with increasing volume, then it's telling you sellers were in control at the top of the candle formation. This will often lead to candles with longer wicks on the top because the sellers prevented the candle from closing near the high of that period. So as the candle attempts to move higher, you might also notice it quickly whips up and down. This is a visualization of buyers and sellers battling for control. Buyers struggling to push prices higher leads to heavy price action, which is just to say price is struggling to move higher because it's so heavy with selling pressure. This could be an indication that price is likely to reverse as more buyers capitulate without the resolution higher they're seeking. Likewise, when a security breaks through a line in the sand for short sellers, it will often explode higher with little to no resistance because of the buying pressure from shorts covering and buyers going long. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to explain the concepts of price action in this method, so we'll conduct a price action workshop in the seventh part of the course with live videos offering practical examples. Chart patterns are distinctive formations created by price action. A pattern can provide clues to the future direction of price, but it only works if other traders see and act upon the pattern. I find they provide conviction in my trade thesis when forming at a technical level where I'm seeking to enter a trade. Here's a look at some, but not all, reversal patterns that seek to profit from a reversal in price. These include double tops, double bottoms, head and shoulders, and rising or falling wedge patterns. In each of these generic examples, you can see the idea of where trades are triggered and where the corresponding risk and profit targets are. Now, of course, it's easy to see the concept of these patterns in theory, but it's much harder to observe them in real time. It takes a lot of experience to read the right side or the undeveloped side of the chart, so don't expect that you'll be able to spot and act upon these patterns so easily. Let's look at my favorite reversal patterns. A double bottom is a popular pattern in which the trader seeks to enter when a stock returns to test a previous low. A buy order can be placed at or near the previous low. This offers the tightest risk possible, however it requires executing before price has confirmed if it will hold that support level. The significance of the support level and how price action approaches the double bottom is key for dictating how I would execute such a trade. In this example, the stock had an extended run with speed and distance coming into the double bottom. Only with that speed and distance coming into the level will I execute without waiting for confirmation. This trade would have netted a quick $1 per share gain with potential for much more. Now not all double bottoms are created equal though. You need to pay attention to all observable clues the chart is giving you. In this example, the stock broke through a double bottom before bouncing back above it. If you had bought into the level without confirmation, then you were probably stopped out on the trade. Now there's a couple of red flags in this example that would have prevented me from buying the double bottom without confirmation. First of all, you can see price was trending below the 5 minute 9 EMA as it approached the double bottom, so there was no immediate edge for buying into the level given the lack of extension, or in other words, no speed and distance into the level. Only when it broke through the double bottom did we see some extension. Additionally, price actually put in a lower high about 15 minutes prior to the double bottom. 
Now this could indicate the continuation of a downtrend, thus a double bottom may not hold. Waiting for confirmation in this instance was the better strategy. If price quickly bounces back over the support level and holds, then you can bet short sellers who chase the break below support will be forced to stop out, helping propel the stock higher. A double top is effectively the same concept as a double bottom, and thus the same rules apply, except you're looking to profit from a decline in price of the security. A rising wedge is a bearish chart pattern observed when prices rise in a tightening wedge after an initial decline. As with other flag patterns, the trigger is a breakout of the wedge on increasing volume. A higher low occurs when price fails to reach the previous low. These offer a great way to confirm a reversal in trend. Now they might occur after a double bottom pattern, so even if you miss a double bottom entry, you can still watch for a second entry off of a higher low. Spotting these in real time can be difficult and require some macro context. Is the daily time frame supporting a bullish trend? Or maybe there's a positive catalyst supporting a bullish thesis. Furthermore, ask yourself, if you were short, where would you stop out? You need to look at these charts and consider how different market participants have positioned themselves and where their most likely risk levels are. A great example is when a stock briefly breaks a support level and then immediately reclaims it. Any short sellers who chase that break of support will be trapped and forced to stop out when price holds the higher low. A lower high is effectively the opposite of a higher low and can be used to enter a short position on the stock. In this example, you can see how buyers got trapped on the opening candle, leaving behind that long upper wick. When price came back up, it failed to match or break that morning high, creating a doji candle and a lower high. This confirmed the short-term selling trend, leading to a new low price. Continuation patterns such as bull flags, bear flags, bullish and bearish pennants, and falling or rising wedges are another favorite among traders. These are patterns that indicate a continuation in the trend. They form during a period of lower trading volume as the security consolidates before the next leg of the trend. The triggers for these patterns are a clear breakout of the established trend on increasing volume. These are some of the most popular patterns given the clear entry and stop loss criteria. Let's give you a better idea by looking at some specific chart examples. So a bull flag is a bullish pattern that forms a flagpole, if you will, on rising price, followed by a period of consolidation on lighter volume, which forms the flag. It's important that this price pattern develops over a significant technical level. In this example, you can see price broke through the prior day's high and formed the bull flag holding over that level before the trend continued higher. A bear flag is a common pattern established after an initial price decline. Visually, it appears as an upside down flag, with the flagpole consisting of declining candles and the flag itself represented in a period of consolidation on lighter volume. This formation indicates that selling pressure is still present and is likely to result in another leg down. Often the second move will be of equal distance as the initial flagpole, and that can be used as an area to target on the trade. Similar to bull and bear flags, pennant formations are defined by a triangular shape forming a pennant on the flagpole. In this example, you can see a clear bullish pennant formation on Boeing throughout the morning session. This led to a second move higher in the afternoon. The trigger for this trade is a breakout of the pennant on increasing volume. While charts and patterns offer a more visual experience for observing price action, Market depth, also called level two, is another form of market data that you can use. Most brokers with direct access platforms will provide market depth for the stocks we trade options on, as well as the option contracts we're trading. While you can certainly trade without level two, I consider it very important for my style of trading. Looking at this level two window for Apple's stock, you can see buyers are sitting in the market bidding for shares at different price levels on the left side. Likewise, on the right side, you can see sellers asking or offering to sell shares at different price levels. We call each side the bid and ask. The top level is the best bid and ask price, or the top of the market. Here you can see $129.89 at the top of the bid and $129.90 at the top of the ask. The difference between the best bid and ask price is called the bid ask spread. As we learned in the first part of the course, liquidity is essential for day trading in order to control risk. So ideally, we want the spread to be as tight as possible. 
Moving down the levels allows you to see the depth of the market. So in this example, you can see the bottom of the bid is at $128.30 and the bottom of the ask is at $135.69. In addition to the price levels, you can also see the quantity of shares on the bid and ask. These are typically in multiples of 100. So the 17 displayed at the top of the bid in this example is actually 1,700 shares. This can tell you at which price level there appears to be a lot of buyers or sellers and therefore may indicate strong support or resistance. A useful way of looking at this is if you see a support level on the chart and the level two indicates a lot of bids at that price level, then you may have conviction to execute a trade there. A word of caution, it's possible for buyers and sellers to hide their order size. So it may only look like 300 shares are on the top of the ask in this example, but it could be far more than that. Additionally, the level two on large caps can be very difficult to read because of high frequency trading by institutions and algorithms. Now I always have it open when trading, but I don't worry too much about watching the stocks level two, unless it's at an important technical level that I'm watching from the chart. The last bit of data is simply the exchange where the orders are being placed. You don't really need to concern yourself with that. Time and sales, also called the tape, is an extremely valuable tool traders can utilize for observing price action. The name time and sales simply refers to the time and price points that transactions occurred. It's the best real-time data available to a trader. It can be used in numerous ways. I find it most useful for monitoring a stock's momentum. When a lot of orders are being executed, the tape will move at a high rate of speed. This can provide conviction for momentum-based trades as you're able to gauge the increasing volume in real time. The speed of the tape is the most obvious indicator of momentum and volatility. As the stock nears a reversal point, the tape will begin to slow as buyers and sellers become exhausted. This nuance is important for scalping a counter trend or reversal trade. Additionally, the tape makes it possible to spot a hidden buyer or seller. As we just learned, buyers and sellers can hide the size of their orders on level two. So if you see more orders being filled at a price level on the tape than is being shown on level two, then it's obvious their true order size is being hidden. Looking at this example, you'll see different colors printed on the tape. Typically colors printed in green indicate buy orders that were filled at the ask. Buy orders filled above the ask are highlighted in green, which make it easier to see when buyers are willing to pay a higher price to get filled above the ask, which tends to drive the price of the security higher very quickly. This sense of urgency is a driving factor of momentum. Likewise, red prints are sell orders filled at the bid and highlighted red prints are filled below the bid. Finally, white prints indicate orders that were filled in the spread between the bid and the ask. Here's a screenshot from the layout on my trading platform. I have an option level two next to the stocks level two and time and sales. The option level two is identical to the stocks. However, it will usually include some additional information related to the option itself. Here, we can not only see the market depth and time and sales for the option selected, but also the strike, expiration, date, volume, open interest, and the Greeks, which influence the worth of the option. Now, don't worry if you didn't understand any of those terms, We'll be learning all about options and what all of that means in the sixth part of this course. As a reminder, you can also access a glossary of terms linked in the description box below. Market internals is a form of market data that I use to determine the sentiment of the overall market. It refers to several data points that look at all of the stocks trading on an exchange like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Now this is useful because sometimes an index like the S&P 500 may appear bullish or bearish on the day, but it can be misleading due to a handful of mega cap stocks that weigh heavily on the index. For example, if the largest companies like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and others are bearish on the day, then it may cause a price decline in the major indices. However, it may be the case that most stocks are actually advancing that day while a few of the heavier weighted stocks are declining. This results in divergence or a disconnect between the price movement of the index and what hundreds of other stocks are actually doing. Therefore, it can be difficult to observe the broad picture of the market by simply watching a price chart of the indices. This is where market internals are helpful by evaluating all stocks, not just the heavyweights. The data points I follow include the tick index, market breadth, and the advanced decline line for both the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. 
This image depicts the tick index for the New York Stock Exchange. This is simply a visual representation that compares the number of stocks that are rising to the number of stocks that are falling. It measures stocks making an uptick and subtracts stocks making a downtick. So for example, there are roughly 2,800 stocks listed in the New York Stock Exchange. So if 1,800 stocks have made an uptick and 1,000 stocks have made a downtick, then the tick index would equal positive 800 because 1,800 minus 1,000 equals 800. Of all the market internals, the tick is the closest to real time and is therefore useful as a short-term indicator. I view it on a 15 minute time frame and I look for candles closing above or below the zero line to gauge bullish or bearish sentiment. Additionally, when ticks reach extreme values of 1000 or greater, then it can often signal a short term reversal is imminent. The advanced decline line is a technical indicator that plots the difference between the number of advancing and declining stocks on a daily basis. It basically tells you whether there are more stocks rising or falling. You can use it to confirm price trends in major indices, and it can also warn of reversals when divergence occurs. One strategy is to watch for reversals that occur off the zero line after an opening gap. For example, if the market opens with a gap up, I will watch the advanced decline line to fade to the zero line for a potential buy point on SPY, the ETF that tracks the S&P 500. Now, of course, this isn't a trigger for such a trade on its own, but it can be a powerful tool when combined with technical analysis on the instrument you're seeking to trade. The last indicator is market breadth, which looks at stocks advancing relative to those declining by considering the volume of both. This is because price moves on larger volume are considered to be more significant than price moves on lower volume. The easiest way to read this is in a ratio format. A positive ratio is bullish, while a negative ratio is bearish. For example, a breadth of 1 to 1 is neutral to bullish, but a breadth of 3 to 1 or greater is perceived as very bullish. Likewise, a breadth of negative 3 to 1 or greater is very bearish. This indicator is the slowest of all the market internals, so it's not something to be used for short-term trade decisions. All of these market internals are freely available on the Thinkorswim platform. The symbols are TICK for the tick, ADD for the advanced decline line, and VOLD for the breadth of the New York Stock Exchange. I am, however, using some custom scripts that were developed by Shadow Trader, which improves the usefulness of these. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to share these custom scripts with you, but most of them are free if you'd like to use them for yourself. Check out Shadow Trader's website at shadowtrader.net where you can find all of these indicators if you'd like to use them. Now, because we're trading over an extremely short time frame, we don't really care as much about fundamentals of a company, such as their earnings, cash flow, debt, etc. However, we do need to be aware of any significant fundamental news on the day that could be a catalyst for the stock to trade higher or lower. When a company releases their earnings every quarter, it can bring a lot of volatility to the stock. Always be aware of approaching earnings dates and never hold a position into earnings. We're generally flat all positions at the end of the day, so this shouldn't be a problem. Now, the week that a company is scheduled to release their earnings, the premium for option contracts will be inflated because of the anticipated volatility around the earnings news. Another potential catalyst is when an analyst upgrades or downgrades a stock. Note that not every firm carries the same weight. Top firms like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Citi, Wedbush, Bank of America, Barclays, and Wells Fargo will be more respected among traders and investors. Beyond specific companies, it's very important we know about any market moving news or events. Major events include, but are not limited to, Fed meetings or interest rate decisions, GDP numbers, unemployment, political news, etc. All right, guys, so that wraps up the fourth part of the course. Really hope you enjoyed it. In the next part, we're going to be doing a technical analysis workshop where we can apply the skills that we've learned, including support and resistance, trend lines, and just look at things in more of a practical method. As always, I really appreciate you guys watching. Please hit that like button if you enjoyed the video. That always helps support the channel, and I greatly appreciate that. So until the next one, take care, and I'll see you then.